Ladies and gentlemen, on June 14th, Jefferson, Jefferson Sessions, Attorney General of the United States of America, said in a public speech, we mentioned it already today, I would cite the Apostle Paul and his clear and wise command in Romans 13 to obey the laws of the government because God has ordained them for the purpose of order. This reference to the Bible and its religious authority meant to strengthen Trump's zero-tolerance prosecution policy on illegal immigration. Who is the guilty party in this affair? Should we accuse the Apostle Paul? Perhaps he should never have written this passage that was used many times to legit legitimize ethically unacceptable regimes. Or should we rather excuse Paul and hold attorney sessions accountable of being an abuser of the Bible? This case exemplifies a more general issue. We can approach the theme of our conference from the direction of reception history, focusing on those who read and use biblical texts, or as Wirkungsgeschichte, looking at the texts themselves and their effects in the stream of the history of ideas. As we set out in this conference to try and understand some major lines of the political dimension of the Bible and especially its reception history over two millennia, we are facing many conceptual and methodological challenges. It goes without saying that the Bible is a pluriform reality that developed through many centuries and is handed down in diverse forms of the canon and in many languages. Even less clearly defined, however, is the term politics. I would propose to go with a simple working definition taken from a German introduction to political science. Bernauer, Kuhn, and Walter define politics as social action that is directed towards decisions and steering mechanisms that are generally binding and regulate the coexistence of people. If we thus graciously embrace a wide understanding of our central terms, the Bible and politics, and start to think about their relationship, we will encounter an infinite variety of ways in which the Bible addresses political issues and how the Bible has been used or abused to address political issues. If we try to trace major lines of the history of the political reception of the Bible, we need some basic tools to analyze this complexity. I think we should frame our investigation in a general theory of the reception of canonical and sacred texts and highlight those aspects that are especially relevant for specifically political reception. My basic proposal is that we should always consider three basic aspects. First, the biblical texts themselves. Second, the hermeneutical attitudes and strategies of those who receive and use them. And third, the social setting of reception, especially its institutional setting. While I hope that this basic proposal will be easy to accept, God is in the details, as A.B. Warburg liked to say about analyzing reception in the history of art. Looking at the biblical texts themselves with an interest in their political nature, it springs to mind that they are extremely diverse in terms of genre, style, and content. Some can be considered generally political. This is quite obvious for the Exodus story that Jan Asman recently called the Revolution der Alten Welt. Jan was sorry not to be able to contribute to this conference. Other clearly political texts that we discussed today already reflect on the nature of kingship. In Deuteronomy 17, the voice of Moses claims authority over the king whom Israel may choose in the future, demanding that he have a copy of the Mosaic Torah written to study it all the days of his life. The historical development of this text is controversial. It is generally considered to have been composed and redacted between the Neo-Assyrian and the Persian periods. 
While authors and editors may have had different political agendas in such diverse contexts, it seems clear that in verse 18, a priestly group highly concerned with legal instruction, the Levitical priests in charge of this Torah, is interested in influencing a potential holder of political office. There are, on the other hand, texts that could be considered generally unpolitical, such as the reflection on suffering in Job, or the love poetry in Song of Songs. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine, or O oh my dove in the clefts of the rock, in the cupboard of the cliff, are not precisely political claims. But perhaps we should not forget that the male lover in the song, after all, is King Solomon, so that even the Song of Songs may have political implication, implications. And I was fascinated to hear uh, about political reception and violent even reception of Song of Songs uh, in the context of the Crusades. Another general feature of biblical texts concerns the historical political uh, context in which they emerged. The vast majority of biblical texts were composed by members of Israelite, Judahite, and early Jewish communities in the context of foreign domination under the Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian, Hellenistic, and Roman empires. The loss of political sovereignty led to the, a tendency to spiritualize political interests. The prophets tend to portray the God of Israel as the ultimate Lord of history. In Deuteronomy Isaiah, for example, the God of Israel calls King Cyrus of Persia his anointed, who is supposed to protect Israel. Early apocalyptic literature, such as Daniel, tries to deal with imperial dominion in religious terms. In a similar vein, the early Christian movement cultivated the idea of the kingdom of God as a counter-reality against the experience of a sometimes violent real political Roman Empire. This tension becomes dramatically explicit in Jesus' process before Pontius Pilate in the Gospel of John, when Jesus claims to be a king, but that his kingdom is not from this world. The graphic extreme of this tension is the sign on the cross on which the executed criminal is called King of the Jews. The Bible reflects roughly a millennium of political developments and the fate of quite small communities between the power plays of large empires. The great diversity of political, legal, historiographical, ethical, and religious claims found in the Bible has offered an extremely flexible and polyvalent treasure of ideas, treasury of ideas, for those who were interested in using their authority for political purposes. Adding to this complexity, and this will be my second point, a great diversity of hermeneutical attitudes and strategies has been applied to these biblical texts. On the handout, I've listed a variety of aspects that have influenced the interpretation of the Bible, but I shall refer only to a few of them especially relevant for political modes of reception. The belief that biblical texts originate from divine revelation attributes to them unsurpassable authority among communities of believers, which has granted these texts great political relevance. The authority of biblical texts could be used to endorse the legitimacy of holders of political power or to question it. A highly influential hermeneutical figure of thought from the late antiquity to the early modern period was what Erich Auerbach called figuraldeutung, figural interpretation, which is close to the concept of typology. Biblical figures or types were seen as prefigurations of later historical figures or events. In political terms, emperors or kings were thus frequently seen as fulfillments of biblical types, that is, for example, as new Davids or new Moseses. 
Martian emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire in the mid-fifth century, was declared Novus David at the Council of Chalcedon. The mosaic in the apse of St. Catherine's Monastery at Mount Sinai shows King David as a Byzantine emperor, most likely Justinian, the monastery's founder in the sixth century. Kings David and Solomon are icons of kingship in the crown first used at the coronation of Otto II in 967 that became the imperial crown of the Holy Roman Empire until 1806. The harp playing David was a model um, of the medieval princeps literatus. In Renaissance Florence, Michelangelo's David became a symbol of the juvenile strength of the city, ready to fight and prevail over mightier powers. Although the quasi-ontological connection between biblical and real political figures was transformed in the early modern period, the David story has remained extremely significant in European and English political discourse in the 16th and 17th centuries. Here, for example, we see Charles I as the persecuted David in the frontispiece of Virgilio Malvezzi's political tractate Il Davide Perseguidato. Several historians have analyzed the political Bible in early modern England. I shall mention especially our speakers of tomorrow morning, Kevin Killeen and John Coffey. Besides endorsing the legitimacy of rulers, the Bible could be used to support or overthrow the legitimacy of specific policies or even political systems. This procedure implied a specific hermeneutical expectation of truth. Many intellectuals of the early modern period expected from the Bible truth not only in the realm of religion, but also of politics. As God had revealed a political constitution for Israel, this was to be considered the ideal constitution in general. This hermeneutical attitude is behind the early modern phenomenon of political Hebraism that was especially brought to light by Eric Nelson, whose contribution we will hear tomorrow afternoon. Political Hebraism is little known in contemporary perception of the history of political thought. In Europe, it seems to me, the notion of the separation of politics and religion successfully represses the fact that several early modern political theorists presupposed the political truth of the Bible. Most European students of political science will consider Thomas Hobbes an eminent figure in the history of political thought, but few, I think, are aware to what extent he engaged with the Bible. Another important hermeneutical issue concerns the tension of originalism versus traditionalism, as Holger Zellentin formulated it last year at our conference, the political power of sacred texts. Holger showed that originalism, commonly known in the Reformation's principle of sola scriptura, frequently appears in the history of interpretation of both sacred and political texts. At the same time, recourse to traditional readings, and uh, Nick Morton, Morton uh, gave beautiful examples of the power of the tradition of uh, readings, is employed also by those who claim to be originalists. In the early modern period, proponents of any political ideology would reason with biblical arguments, and all, of course, would find excellent biblical support for their respective agendas. This brings us to the question of how political interests of recipients relate to the biblical texts that they read and use. Herfried Münkler, an expert in political theory and the history of ideas at Humboldt University in Berlin, helpfully distinguished between the mere use of biblical examples to authenticate a claim, and cases of reception in which biblical texts have 
theoriekonstitutive Bedeutung, that is, constitutive relevance for the political theory derived from them. Eric Nelson has shown, for example, that the reception of the Jubilee year in Leviticus 25 led to the rediscovery of generally political, biblical political thought. Since the 18th century, hermeneutical attitudes towards the Bible have gone quite different ways in Europe and in North America. In Europe, the Bible has lost ground in most political arenas, and most Europeans would probably approve of this fact. In the United States, in contrast, a continuous tradition from, a fa from the founding fathers through the 19th century has preserved the Bible as a significant player in the political arena up to the present day. In his iconic last speech, I have been to the mountaintop. Martin Luther King identified himself with Moses at Mount Nebo. Barack Obama continued this line of thought in his repeated rhetorical motif, you are the Joshua generation. These examples of a political activist and a head of state bring me to my third point, the social setting of reception. I shall here concentrate on, on institutional reception that is specifically important for the political relevance of the Bible. Within the Bible itself, we find the idea of institutional public proclamation and teaching of the Torah in Deuteronomy 31. Moses writes down this Torah and instructs the priests and elders to assemble the people every seventh year at the festival of booths to proclaim the words of this Torah. This instruction may well be influenced by the near Assyrian Akito festival at which as a Haddon succession treaty was read to assemblies of officials who were obliged to swear loyalty to the king and his crown prince. If this is the case, public liturgical reading historically originates in a neo-Assyrian tool of imperial power that was transformed by biblical authors into a subversive tool to cultivate group identity. Public liturgy centered on the sacred revelation has allowed Judaism and derived from this tradition also Christianity and Islam to maintain collective identity in wide geographical dispersion ever since. Besides the liturgical forms of reception that provide, provided the most prolific institutional context for the continuous reception of biblical texts, we should consider normative institutions. The most immediate political application was implemented by institutions that considered themselves authorized and obliged to realize biblical revelation in a political realm. Examples of such institutions were, in quite diverse historical realizations, the post-exilic high priesthood in Jerusalem, the Maccabean leaders, the Sanhedrin, Christian bishops, patriarchs, the papacy, but also Christian emperors and kings. Most likely, even some politicians of modern states considered or consider themselves agents of the divine law. A groundbreaking study, especially for the medieval history uh, of the role of the divine law is Rémi Braque's La Loi de Dieu. Academic institutions evolved from the tradition of synagogues, cathedral schools, and monasteries. The early universities were centrally concerned with theology and the study of the Bible. Some still show biblical symbols in their seal. The redefinition of the Bible as a historical source to be critically examined during the Enlightenment, however, historicized the Bible and removed it to some extent from its contemporary living reality. Michael Legaspi entitled this process The Death of Scripture and the Rise of Biblical Studies. The historical critical study of the Bible 
to which also the Pontifical Biblical Institute has been devoted since the second half of the last century, clearly have a political function as they question and discourage naive fundamentalist reading. At the same time, historical critical inquiry has alienated itself from the Bible as a living object in continuous contemporary applications, including the political sphere. The recent interest of many biblical scholars in the reception history of the Bible helps regain some ground in this area. I think it is part of our contemporary responsibility to bridge the gap between historical critical inquiry, to which we remain committed, and contemporary relevance. We need to open our eyes to what is actually going on in the political use of the Bible, not only in the words of Barack Obama or attorney Sessions, but also, for example, in recent electoral campaigns in Kenya. Only recently I learned from our African students that the Bible figures prominently in contemporary African politics, often in problematic ways. And com I'm coming to a close. I have proposed that there are three basic coordinates of the political Wirkungsgeschichte and reception history of the Bible. The genre, content and, sty content and style of the biblical texts themselves, hermeneutical attitudes and strategies of its readers, and the social setting of reception. More important than such basic elements of theory of political reception, however, is the analysis itself. I am therefore very grateful to all the specialists in quite different areas of the humanities who are engaged in this interdisciplinary conference. I am confident that the diverse approaches and the exemplary analyses presented during these two days will help us sharpen our hermeneutical awareness and our methodological tools to analyze the political dimension and reception of the Bible. For now, I will be most interested in your methodological reflections. Thank you very much for your attention.